And that ends our seminar. Thank you very much. No, uh, apologies for uh, not having the uh, microphone unmuted. Basically, I just went over the um, logistics. So if you have questions online, please raise your hand in the chat. Um, Rose will uh, respond via the chat and also monitor all the Zoom activities. Uh, I just made an announcement again, uh, next week's seminar, Dave Sutherland, an associate professor at U University of Oregon's Department of Earth Sciences, will be giving a seminar entitled Buried or Fried, Understanding Sedimentation and Temperature Effects on Native Species Restoration in the South Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve and the Coos Estuary. Um, all right, so that brings us to our today's speaker. Um, Sarah Mesnick uh, is uh, with the Southwest Fishery Science Center, uh, National Marine Fishery Center at NOAA and the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. She's an ecologist and science liaison for strategic initiatives, uh, external relations and communication uh, for the Southwest Fishery Science Center. Uh, she's also an adjunct professor at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography at UC San Diego. She is also an ecologist in the Marine Mammal and Turtle Division and science liaison at the Southwest Fishery Science Center in La Jolla. Uh, her research on the behavioral ecology of marine mammals aims to increase our understanding of evolution patterns and improve conservation outcomes. She has published papers on sexual selection, species diversity, population and social structure, conservation behavior, and the delimination of units to conserve using behavioral characters. She has worked in the Gulf of California since 1986 and has been involved in vaquita conservation for much of this time. Sarah serves on the International Recovery Team for Vaquita, uh, CIRVA, CIRVA, the International Whaling Commission's Expert Panel on Bycatch Mitigation and Convention on Migratory Species, uh, Expert Working Group on Culture and Social Complex, uh, Socially Complex, com, blah, 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 complex Complexity. She is a founding member of the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation at Scripps, where she leads the Sustainable Seafood Initiative for the Southwest Fishery Science Center. She's also a founding member of Fish Full Future, a collaboration of scientists, fishers, chefs, and processors, creating new ways to minimize waste and maximize value for local fisheries. Uh, Sarah received her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Arizona in 1996. And I've had the pleasure of working with her for many years now uh, with the uh, Society for the Advancement of uh, Native Americans and Chicanos in Science, SACNES, uh, at a conference putting together proposals to increase uh, underrepresented uh, students in STEM, so, and in particular marine sciences. So, uh, with that, would you please join me in welcoming Sarah? Thank you, Ichung. Can everyone hear me both online and in here in the room? So thank you, Ichung, for that great introduction. And yes, we've been uh, um, colleagues for a long time, as I am with many of the people here at OSU. So it's really great to be here. Um, I want to thank Lisa Balance, um, director of MMI, for the invitation to come speak today and to the broader um, Hatfield Marine Science Center community um, for, um, in particular, Bob Cohen, director, uh, Cinnamon Moffat, and Ichung Chung for hosting me today. It's an honor to be invited here. And I don't say that lightly. It's not just because of this great room or that the sun is coming out outside, um, but um, Hatfield represents something really special. And this collaboration that you have between the OSU colleges, federal and state agencies, and this welcome atmosphere for students and for visiting scholars is, is really special. And somehow you have mastered the secret of breaking down silos and collaborating across disciplines for science and supportive society. 
So it is really wonderful to be here and I look forward to meeting many of you that I don't already know and those that I do um, online um, afterwards and in any way that we can follow up. This is meant to be really casual and I hope and welcome a lot of questions. Just a few months ago, back in November, a few miles outside of San Felipe, we saw vaquitas. And this is in northern Mexico. We saw vaquitas, they were fat, and they had calves. They are survivors, and they're why I'm here today. Vaquita is an unusual conservation issue in that we know exactly what the problem is, and we know exactly what we need to do which is to remove all gill nets from their habitat. What we didn't realize uh, was the magnitude of what we were up against. Vaquita is one of a growing number of cases linking illegal wildlife trade, organized crime, and the loss of biodiversity. Daunting challenges that undermine both conservation and human potential in the region. This presentation will review the biology and status of vaquita, conservation actions, and the impact of distant markets on local economies and ecosystems. Specifically, I'll share the dire threats that are posed by illegal wildlife trafficking and black markets, and the continuing challenges we face to develop blue markets, legal, ecologically sustainable, gillnet-free fisheries, for saving vaquita while also supporting local communities. And I'll wrap up with what we as consumers can do to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. For this presentation, I'll be drawing on heavily the expertise of many, many people that are devoted to saving vaquita. These are local fishermen, local conservationists, and people uh, from the international community that work together to find solutions. Black markets, illegal harvest, trade, and use of wild animals and their parts, or in some cases, the incidental take associated with illegal harvest uh, are driving unsustainable declines and possible extinction of species around the globe. Many examples are well known. Elephant ivory, rhino horn, pangolin scales, shark fin. Marine mammal examples are less well known, but both vaquita, which is experiencing a 99% decline, and Caspian seals, experiencing a 90% decline, are bycatch in fisheries that are targeting an illegal product sold on an international black market. In the case of vaquita, that's the totuaba, which is a large fish, the swim bladder of the large fish, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. And in the case of the Caspian seal, it's uh, caviar from sturgeon. And in West Africa, manatees are targeted for their parts. This illegal wildlife trafficking is worth billions of dollars globally and is often transnational, which makes it more complex. And sometimes it's dangerously connected to organized crime, drug trafficking, and corruption. The rate of poaching can, and often does, vastly surpass the biological capacity of species and the speed with which human policies to counter it can be implemented. And I'll illustrate both of these in the case of vaquita. So vaquita are one of seven porpoises. They're the smallest marine mammal, about five foot in length, just a little bit um, shorter than I am. They're slow reproducing and can have one calf every year or two. And they were never thought to be very abundant. Since the moment that the first vaquita was found, and this is just back in the 1950s, by, uh, found by a scientist, back in the 1950s, uh, the, uh, the a skull was found on the beach by Ken Norris. And he described that in a paper in 1958. And in that paper, and also in his field notes, he notes that this first skull that I pulled from the sand dunes was most likely a vaquita that had died in a fisherman's net. So it's been known since the discovery by science of the vaquita that gill nets were a risk. And gill nets of, are used in the upper Gulf 
for all sorts of species from shrimp to finfish and shark. And uh, gill nuts of all mesh sizes are dangerous to the Akita, but most dangerous are those for species that are about the same size as the Akita, the totuaba and shark. The Akita have a very tiny distribution. They're found only in a very small area in the northwesternmost upper Gulf of California, just south of San Diego, where I'm from and where extreme tidal ranges pump nutrients into the local waters. And these animals are adapted to this murky, muddy bottom and very productive waters where fish and shrimp also attract fishermen. Uh, the Vaquita habitat is surrounded by closely by two communities, El Golfo and San Felipe, and they mainly uh, fishermen there mainly make their living uh, using gill nets. And most of the fin fish is consumed domestically, but um, until recently, most of the shrimp was exported to the United States. So this complete overlap between where vaquita live and where these community fish um, provides both problems, but also opportunities. Opportunities to harness the power of blue markets to incentivize the use of alternatives to gill nets. But we've been challenged to scale even small successful pilot studies. And the result of that is that bycatch and gill nets is driving uh, Bikita towards extinction. Uh, aerial, visual, and acoustic methods, innovations in all of those areas of science have been used to survey for Bikita. And these efforts date back to the 1980s. The first large survey for Vaquita was in 1997, and Bob Pittman, Lisa Balance uh, here in the audience were instrumental in that work and motivating that uh, study. And since then, the decline of the Vaquita from about 560 animals in 1997 to less than 20 in the last full. Um, uh, abundance estimate in 2019 um, down to 20 animals uh, is the fastest and the steepest decline of any animal population recorded in the last 50 years. And that rate of decline, as I mentioned, was accelerated due to illegal totuaba fishery. The Kita was declining about 8% per year um, due to uh, the fisheries for shrimp and finfish, but that decline accelerated um, with the resurgence of the illegal totuaba fishery from 30 to 50% per year. Um, the last, um, in 2019 and 2021, we went back into the field and we looked for vaquita in the area where we've had the most acoustic recordings. And the most recent estimate from just um, back in November is five to 13 animals, um, including one to two calves in this area called the zero tolerance area where the most acoustic recordings have been uh, found. And that number was actually a surprise, not only because it is so small, but because of that rate of decline, we actually thought they would most likely be extinct by now. So finding a few vaquita actually gives us some hope. And these remaining vaquita are survivors. And it's interesting that many of them have scars uh, from gill nets. And so one of the thoughts is they're not a random selection of individuals, but rather they're selected individuals that may have learned to avoid gill nets in some way. Um, guarding these netwise individuals may save the species. Uh, recent studies in some other areas have also uh, improved the possibility of recovery if we were able to get gill nets out. One of those is that um, the keto were found that they may be able to breed every year, not just every other year. So the rate of recovery could be faster. And also genetic data by Phil Morin and colleagues has found that the historic population has been low for a long time. And this may mean that animal, the, the, the species was able to purge deleterious alleles 
and that inbreeding depression does not seem to be a concern at this time. So putting these things together that we still see the keto, they still have calves, they look healthy. They may be able to uh, reproduce at a faster rate and they're not inbred, gives us hope. But the only way to save these animals is to get the guillemets out of the water. Uh, an unprecedented amount of money and effort has actually been pouring into the upper goal. And so it is surprising with all this effort that we're not doing well to reverse this trend. And I'm going to show you just some of the things that have happened over the last uh, couple decades. Um, due to their small distribution, it was initially thought that marine protected areas made sense. And since the 1980s and 1990s, there's been a number of protected areas declared in the area, including a biosphere reserve. The most recent of which is called the zero tolerance area, which I referred to a moment ago. This is the area where the most uh, acoustic recordings of Vaquita have been um, observed. And that is now in 2019 was declared a no-go zone, no fishing, not even transiting through the area but this has been blatantly disregarded. Um, there's been a number of fisheries regulations over the years, over 20, um, serving to ban gill nets either sequentially or now totally. So since 2017, all gill nets in the area are banned. They're, and they're banned not only on the water, but on land. And you'll see that that also has not worked. Um, enforcement and penalties have been increased. So um, having a gill net or trafficking in Totoaba is a felony, but there's been few arrests. Um, ghost gear, abandoned gill nets have been removed, over a thousand gill nets removed in the last few years, but that effort ended. Um, Vaquita CPR, which was an effort to have captive care of remaining Vaquita until gill nets could be removed. Um, was an, a very large international effort in 2017, but unfortunately it did not succeed and an uh, female, adult female was uh, killed in the process. And so that project ended. There's a lot of international engagement. Under the US Marine Mammal Import Rule, um, all fishery products from the upper Gulf are banned from the entry into the US. The UNESCO has declared um, the Biosphere Reserve um, and UNESCO World Heritage Site in danger. Um, and then other organizations, CITES, IUCN, IWC, um, the Marine Mammal Society, and other trade um, agreements such as the USMCA, all have come out against the continued use of gill nuts in the area. And lastly, um, support for alternative gear, fishing, um, support for the local fishing communities. This has included a variety of um, things, including compensation for not fishing and gear development and replacement. But much of that also um, has ended, the support for that has ended, including um, efforts to electronically track fishing vessels. So the, the point of this is that a lot has been done in the area, but we have not been able to be successful in removing gill nets. Um, these efforts, um, we've done some um, back of the hand calculations, about $122 million invested in the area, but most of that, the vast majority is invested in not fishing. The fishermen being kept off the water or banned from areas. And what has not happened is support for this last um, piece. How do we support fishermen using other methods and being able to benefit from the fishery resources in the region without hurting the Kita? So there's um, three main reasons um, for the challenges that we face. Um, the first is gillnets dominate the fisheries in the upper Gulf. They've been in use since the 1940s and fishermen prefer them. They're relatively easy to use. They're not that expensive. And they um, like them despite all this effort to shut them out of the area. 
They don't believe that alternative gears will work or that they will be um, economically viable. Uh, they have um, little incentive to try other alternatives because of the lack of enforcement and this lack of investment in other ways of fishing or support for that. And there's a lack of social capital or community buy-in. Conservation is not seen to benefit the fishers or their interests, and the fishers don't feel uh, regulations are legitimate. So there's a lot of lack of community buy-in in moving forward. The second um, big issue facing us is this resurgence of poaching for totuaba. Totuaba, uh, which is a large croaker, almost as big as the kita, um, is a uh, species also endemic to the Gulf of California. And it, um, through heavy fishing in the 1940s, um, is also been declared endangered and is been on the endangered species list since the 1990s. There was a complete ban on fishing, but as the population began to recover, any legal fishery for the species also began. And this happened in about the early 2010s. And this poaching is motivated by the high price for the swim bladder of the fish. So this is the organ that en enables the fish and many fishes to maintain their buoyancy in the water. And that swim bladder is worth a lot. And fishermen use gill nets to um, pursue totuaba. And a swim, a totuaba swim bladder can be worth between $500 and up to $8,500 per kilogram. So that's far more than gold, than cocaine, and other drugs. Um, one, a fisherman in one day catching a number of totuaba can make over $100,000. And this compares to a very good price at the time, at the peak of the Totoba fishery of about $19 a kilo for shrimp. So high price driving this fishery. And the fishery for Totoba is actually driven by demand far away in China. And that this is where the swim bladders are dried and sold for traditional medicine, um, but also as um, investments and luxury items. And they can be stored like gold in a safe, gifted or um, saved for the value to increase sometime in the future. And so Totuaba poaching in the Gulf is part of organized international criminal activity. And it has to be addressed as such. It's not um, so much an issue with the tools that we use for fisheries and conservation. We need different tools. So poaching can't be addressed without enforcing this entire um, supply chain from demand in China, the trafficking routes, as well as on the water. The third reason that we face challenges um, is the involvement of organized Mexican criminal groups or cartels in other activities and now including fisheries. So in the last few years, what's happened is instead of the Chinese uh, buyers working to, directly with the fishers in the upper Gulf, Mexican organized crime has inserted itself as middlemen. And this has not only taken over the Totuaba fishery, but also other um, activities in Mexico. And you may have heard of this with in agriculture with avocados or timber. Um, but also in the upper Gulf, it impacts shrimp and other fin fish. So decision-making within the communities is impacted by organized crime and, and coercion. Um, fishers become indebted to the cartels and they can't get out. And sometimes they're paid in drugs, which um, obviously has many impacts. There's another reason um, too, which is related, and it's the long-standing lack of enforcement and corruption in Mexico. Most recently, um, there's been a uh, change in the national policy of, uh, against organized crime, which is a non-confrontational policy. 
And this is especially when locals are involved. So a problem previously where there was a lack of motivation of um, enforcement has been um, increased with this new uh, policy. And this is a game changer for conservation. Um, these tools, as I mentioned, that we're used to using, fisheries and conservation, are not up to the challenge here. So what does this mean? Um, this is a picture from a couple years ago at the height of the Totuaba season. Uh, there was unbridled poaching throughout Vaquita habitat with dozens of boats fishing within the Vaquita refuge. And as we saw in November during the height of the shrimp season with over 100 vessels fishing in the zero tolerance area. So there's just no enforcement of the rules and the use of gill nets is rampant. Fishermen have fewer and fewer options because there's no compensation for not fishing. And yet there's very few alternatives for doing anything else. So they do what they know best and what's most profitable. And you can see these fishermen um, setting out a gill net um, and here are the vaquita right in front of them. So it's really dire. But one of the things, the least supported component of this effort to save the vaquita um, has been the lack of support for alternative fisheries. And CERVA, the International Recovery Team, has mentioned this, needing to support the economic livelihoods of the community since its inception, which was in 1997, and is repeated every year in every meeting of CERVA, that there must be more efforts made to support the local communities because ultimately successful conservation is going to depend on both well-managed fisheries and an economy that supports the local communities. Organized fishermen have long felt that the regulations, the policies and the sanctions all cost them rather than benefit them. So, how do we reverse this? And I want to um, switch now to talk about some of the efforts for blue markets and how we can increase those efforts and those voices. I'd like to introduce you to some of the conservation heroes in the upper Gulf. These are fishermen that have been working for um, easily over a decade now with scientists and conservationists to develop technologies that can be as productive and efficient and effective to use um, as gill nets. And it's a tough challenge. Uh, this is the story of real on the ground conservation heroes. Um, you have Charlie who's sewing a turtle excluder device on a new type of light trawl. You have Tonicho um, shown with that trap. Um, he works with um, gear developers in Europe, um, which put cameras on the trap and can work with him to increase capture. Um, hook and line fishing, um, old technique, but um, bring in a very high quality product. Um, there's Tony, um, Chalunga, who's worked um, on many projects uh, involving uh, acoustic monitoring and other Vaquita science, but also with the alternative gear. And then there's Valeria Towns, who has been working with a number of fishermen and fisherwomen um, in the towns to develop a type of uh, net called a suripera. And this is a little more detail from her work. This is from the previous year fishing season. This is a suripera. It's a fascinating type of uh, net. It looks like two big butterfly nets. It, they are suspended. Um, from uh, kind of big elbows that stick out of the um, small boats. And the boat is not propelled um, when it's fishing by an engine, but by the wind in southern Mexico, but adapted to the upper gulf because of the high tidal flux. And so it, the boat moves with the tide and the shrimp are caught in the nets and are caught live. So really high value quality products. Um, she's been working with 10 vessels, about 20 fishermen, 
and she pairs the fisherman with a gill netter and a fisherman using the light trawl, uh, using a suripara. And what she's found is over time, the competition between the fishermen has increased such that they're getting more people wanting to try the suripara with the challenge and also the success. She's been able to get commercially viable catches. And because of the quality of the product, she's also been able to get premium prices. This, I might mention, was the only legal shrimp that was in uh, the market two years ago. And in addition to the gear, she's also working on developing traceability systems and having onboard observers. So it's moving the fishery forward, not just in the gear, but in the um, market and market access. However, um, it is still perceived uh, that despite um, some um, innovation and some hope in new areas of fishing, that gill nets are still the most profitable way of fishing. So let me show you how her work, some other work of alternative gears compares to the illegal fishing. Um, these are data from not this year, but the previous year, um, the 2021 fishing season. And this was from Valeria's work with the Suriparas. They were able to capture about 12 kilograms of shrimp um, in a typical day, but they had maximum catches of up to 82 kilograms. And what this shows is that there was hope for good days, learning the gear and moving forward to be able to have higher capture rates. Um, average price about $14, shrimp prices vary depending on the size of the shrimp, but also the quality. And she was able to reach premium prices for the larger size classes and specialty markets. But a day of fishing, about $165. Uh, this compares to the typical day of fishing with a gill net. A um, couple gill nets are, you, are used. Um, the catch is not that all that much greater, 23 kilograms on average, but you can have catches up to 100. So it's still seemed by most fishermen that gill nets can catch more. Um, the, Average price, uh, the market at the time was about $12.50, and you can see um, almost $300 of fishing in a day. I'll mention that there were 400 kilo, uh, 400 tons of shrimp caught with gill nets in this year, and one ton caught with the suripara. And what that emphasizes is that with more practice and more people on the water, you can probably get um, even better catches. There just hasn't been much practice with these gear. Um, here's what a day of, an average day of totuaba fishing can get. Um, three swim bladders have an average size about $100 each, and you could easily come in with $2,400. So it's really difficult to compete. But this last year, one of the other types of um, gear, the light trawl, that um, showed you a picture that Charlie was putting the turtle excluder device on. That's having really good uh, average catches, up to 65 or 63 kilograms. They sold that for market prices and showed that it can be competitive. And again, these are under 100 or so trials with these alternative gears. So the point is that there's possibilities here, but there's also, um, a very dynamic uh, suite of situations. For instance, the Suripara, they were not able to get any permits last year to fish. They also were not able to have the room to fish and they were harassed by uh, other fishers using gill nets. Shrimp prices have doubled and that's because it has now been seen that the shrimp can be laundered into the US and garner US prices. Um, it's also um, some pent up demand because of a previous ban on um, shrimp because of turtle excluder device or the lack of turtle excluder devices. So the price of shrimp has doubled. Um, interestingly, uh, something is happening with totuaba over the last couple of years. Uh, the number of totuaba has declined, the size is declining, and therefore the price. So what was a top price of $8,500 for a large female swim bladder 
is now closer to um, the max price being about 2000. So Totuaba prices are declining, shrimp prices are going up. It's a dynamic situation. And there are many ways to be able to work with this um, so that the perceived net income from gillnet fisheries um, can be altered by intervention. And that's intervention in both markets, black and blue. So what do we mean by that? Um, what we mean is that there are ways to increase the price of products in blue markets. And this can be support for legal fishing, making sure these fishermen have their permits, they're able to get on the water where there are not gill nets to be able to use them, and that they have training and the experience and the, just the practice using the gear. It will get better and there will be higher catch rates. And also developing niche markets high price premium markets for a high quality sustainable product. On the other hand, it's really important that we decrease the likelihood of profit in black markets. And this can be done in a uh, large number of ways. Um, policy um, to address mar black markets um, is well established. It is threefold, looking at ways to increase enforcement in the upper Gulf making sure that enforcement is swift and occurs and is also uh, appropriate to the level of involvement in the fisher, fishery. Obviously, a fisherman trying to support his family and using a gill net is very different than a, a buyer or a trafficker um, supporting and promoting that fishery. So we need ways to rehabilitate fishermen and be able to provide alternative livelihoods for them. We need uh, appropriate uh, interdiction along the seafood supply chain and prosecution of traffickers. And we need to reduce distant demand. And that means both through awareness through consumers, but also enforcement and penalties on people selling illegal products. And of course, it also means, imp importantly, economic alternatives alternatives and opportunities for fishermen to do something else um, other than illegal fishing. The problems in the upper Gulf have been exasperated, um, as I mentioned, far beyond the traditional tools. And it means bringing in a very different group of people to help um, solve the situation. Um, what we've learned is that it's imperative that we act early and we take a holistic approach. And this is acting early is really important because it takes a long time, much longer than we expect to develop alternative gears and to get fishermen on the water and able to use them, to look at the and build social capital in these fisheries. But also when black markets and organized crime get established, it is much more difficult to route that out. So you must start early to try to build community buy-in before this possible incursion in places like the upper Gulf where organized crime uh, will take advantage of opportunities, economic opportunities. Um, the other thing is that we need to um, take a holistic approach. Countering black markets is a law enforcement, social, economic, and political issue. Um, as much as it is a fisheries and conservation one. And it underscores this need for a transdisciplinary approach with a wide variety of policy instruments and approaches from the outset. So I wanna uh, talk about the same situation, but from a slightly different perspective. Uh, what we've been talking about up to this point is all pretty much about fishing and what's happening on the water and through uh, the supply chain. What we haven't uh, talked about so much is the people that consume these products. And when we're talking about um, shrimp and fish that come out of um, these areas of the upper Gulf or Mexico, or even here you know, with local fisheries, um, we're talking about all of us, the people that consume uh, seafood. And this gives us an opportunity to rethink our food systems. And another way I like 
saying this is that we ate our way into this problem. Is there a way to eat your way out? And not many problems have uh, a solution like that. So I was curious uh, a few years back how buyers and consumers of shrimp, because most of that was imported into the US, um, how we could get involved. And rather than just standing aside and thinking this was a problem of another place and time. And actively uh, supporting the desire for seafood, uh, in this case, seafood caught without gill nets. And how could we incentivize the change on the water? So how can we be part of the solution rather than part of the problem? Um, I call this uh, culinary conservation. Um, and it's when your conservation goals are aligned with your passion for food. And this is a way to build a sustainable and just uh, economy um, built on this connection between producers and consumers of food. This is um, also something that really reflective of the borderlands region. This region between Southern California and Northern Mexico is known as an area of gastronomy. It's actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site for gastronomy. So we have people really interested in food and where their food comes from. So how do we capture that interest? Um, we did a number of projects related to markets. I'm just going to touch on a couple of them. Um, but we wanted to look at ways to um, better understand the supply chain, how shrimp at that time was coming up um, into the US, and to be able to connect all of the pieces of the supply chain to try to find solutions. Uh, we wanted to investigate ways of altering this balance between the price and the cost of fishing with gill nets. And we wanted to get more engagement among the supply chain. So one of the things um, that we did were a lot of meetings that looked like this, where we brought um, chefs and buyers uh, to meet with the fishermen and just let people talk. And the ideas that people came up with were incredible. Um, and in just, just a few moments, of time together. They looked at ways of increasing the value by simple things like providing ice and enhancing the quality. Uh, direct sales, call it Uberizing the fishery, bringing in more buyers and sellers. Um, value added processing. If you have a shrimp, but you put some garlic sauce on it, you just increase the price. So how can, what are all of the types of things that it can um, be done to increase the value? You can distinguish the um, product in the market and you can celebrate um, champion fishers, which is something that we see often at a store. There may be a story about the guy that grew your carrots, but we don't see that as much about fishermen. Um, also, there's ways of reducing costs. And so the, um, some of these buyers were saying, hey, you know, we can get a truck or we can get an, you know, a refrigerated truck down to you. Just all sorts of ideas for um, increasing the value and decreasing the cost by the people involved themselves. Um, we also embarked on a really big um, study of the San Diego seafood market. And our question um, primarily was, do uh, products that have an eco label, do they um, garner higher prices? And um, the bottom line is that for most wild caught products, that answer is yes. On the right, you see a, a figure um, that non-labeled shrimp compared to shrimp of the same size and type um, that had a yellow Monterey Bay Aquarium label on it. The Monterey Bay Aquarium labeled shrimp garners a higher price and um, that can be quite substantial. And this is not only due to the, um, the product itself, but it's also due to access to certain specialty markets where they can charge higher prices for products. So this seemed to um, be a good indication that if you could have a Vaquita friendly labeled product in the market, it could garner higher prices. And we did this with a lot of different labels. Um, we also worked with uh, bigger industrial um, buyers 
um, showed them what was going on, which they knew um, very, very well, but what they weren't as aware of was all of the interest in, the, in sustainable products and how they could be um, part of this solution rather than just standing by and letting other people solve the problems or address the problems. And the industry itself came up with a new code of conduct. Um, they are developing a verification and traceability system, but a lot of that has stalled in the last couple of years with this incursion of um, more organized crime, the embargo in the US and other things seem to have um, put the industry back into a situation where they're not driving change, but waiting for it. Um, we also um, have sought out and found all sorts of charismatic megafauna chefs and who are concerned about the um, where they get their food from and that have a voice and care about conservation. Um, they use their voices to amplify messages far better than we do in many ways. Um, they have large followings on social media and they can take the messages to big stages. And they also understand how to make um, fishers who are doing the right thing um, into heroes and champions. And so um, collaborating on projects with chefs is not only a lot of fun, but it's very effective. Um, and we've uh, created a lot of uh, uh, videos and other types of materials for consumers. And at the end of the presentation, I'll play one of these videos for you. But the point I want to make is that putting up one video on social media can get hundreds of thousands of hits. And I don't think any of the scientists in the room um, typically see that number of readers on our scientific papers. So it's a great way to get messages out. So um, this um, idea of culinary conservation, I think it's really powerful. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity to harness the conservation efforts with our food systems and use that to preserve biodiversity and support local communities. Um, I've spoken mostly about this work um, as associated it is with the upper Gulf of California, but we have expanded this um, into San Diego. And um, I'm hoping also uh, to do similar kinds of projects where we involve chefs buyers, fishers, and processors to places such as here in Newport, which is a really great fishing community. And we have a um, ongoing proposal actually right now, an ongoing project with Christina DeWitt from OSU, um, looking at ways of increasing value of the landed catch by full utilization of seafood, um, also reducing waste and um, expanding people's palates of what they eat. So I hope to get some questions about that later and happy to talk about that more. So in conclusion, um, black markets, um, IUU, illegal, unregulated uh, fishing, and gill nets are global threats to marine mammals. Uh, they are one of the biggest challenges, but also an opportunity to bring in new ways of changing the situation on the water. And what I mean by that specifically is, do you have innovations? Do you have technological innovations that can help fishermen, that can monitor Vaquita remotely, such as eDNA? This um, innovation lab here, right around the corner from this room, is an amazing place where the solutions um, are nearly endless of what can be uh, thought of when students are faced with a uh, credible challenge and are let free with a room like that to find solutions. Another is uh, that we need these transdisciplinary approaches. Um, this is critical and viable economic alternatives are key to success. And lastly, um, for all of the rest of us, civil society, fishers, processors, and the people that eat and consume seafood, uh, maybe we can help by eating our way out of the problem. So thank you very much.
and I'm really happy to take any questions. Great presentation, difficult challenges. Any questions from the uh, room or online? Hi, Sarah. Great and super depressing talk. Um, so if, you, if we could start now, although we might even be a decade too late, how would you apply these methods to the North Atlantic right whale? Yeah, great question. So um, for those of you um, who may not know what's going on in the um, outside of Maine and Canada and the East Coast um, is right whales are also critically endangered. There's about 350 right whales left in the North Atlantic. And one of the biggest risk factors is um, being caught in crab pots, uh, lobster pots. Sorry, I'm thinking Newport. <laughs> yeah. um, in crab pots and the, sorry, in lobster pots. Um, which similar work is being done on the West Coast with crab to develop pots that are ropeless. And so what happens is you have a pot on the bottom, it's connected to a buoy on the surface with a rope. And so whether it's a humpback um, here on the West Coast getting caught in a Dungeness crab pot, or it's a right whale in the North Atlantic getting caught in a lobster pot, it is a similar situation where you have a potential for a gear fix. Is, there, is it possible to get a lobster or crab from the bottom of the ocean to the boat without a rope in the way? And so one of the uh, most, I think one of the best possibilities is this ropeless gear. The problem is very similar, is that fishermen are used to fishing the way that they fish and they're not inspired to change or innovate and ropeless gear is expensive. So how does the market, how do all of the rest of us say uh, price premium for that or encourage or just um, advertise that some fishermen are doing really cool things and you can come get their lobster right here. So I think there's a gear solution that is really interesting and promising, but needs refinement, needs to come down in cost. Fishermen have to be both encouraged, incentivized, both by higher prices, but also by rules and regulations to switch. And the rest of us need to be aware of this and watch what we're eating and where you can source products that are from fishermen that are trying to um, do the right thing with gear. Yep, yep, and it's a, a nascent um, project with the markets, but it is available, is what I've heard, and they're getting good prices for it, and it's getting exciting. It's a way for people to eat something and save the planet at the same time. So it's a, I think that's really encouraging, and one of the, the differences is it's in the U.S., so there are rules and regulations that can happen. Uh, that may happen at a different um, speed than other places. Yeah, but I can hear you. Um, but the other thing about the right whales is, of course, we've got an international border and climate change is pushing both them and their prey further north. So it's, yeah, it's even trickier. Yeah, it's um, everything is moving. Uh, the and um, I would like to mention a shout out to Josh Stewart, new professor here at OSU, that has done um, really cutting edge work on right whale reproduction and the cost, the additional cost to the animals of carrying around gear and the physiological cost is actually reducing the sizes of right whales. And with size, it re, uh, reduces reproduction. So these have cascading effects on our populations. 
And so solving the gear problem not only enables you to eat lobster, but also may enable a female right whale to have enough energy to grow bigger and have more young. So also um, increasing the population size that way, hopefully, towards recovery. Sarah, do you want to show the video as well? The, yeah. So we, uh, we'll take another question while I put, post <laughs> that up. Can you speak at all as to how or why exactly the Surapara nets are advantageous over the gill nets? Sorry, say that one more. What? Yeah, I, I know can, I need to say can you, it. Sorry, can you speak to how or why the Surapara nets are advantageous over the gill nets? Yeah, a number of reasons. One is the net is right by the fishing vessel. And the vessel is moving and is able to, uh, the shrimp actually dance. They, they in, um, the net tickles the bottom and the shrimp kind of jump into the net, which they are then, um, kind of uh, push through the net into a um, small area where they can be picked up. And the point is the fishermen are working with the net all the time. There's not a way for a vaquita to get in this net. And if they're, because of the boat and the fishermen being there, they're able to prevent um, the, in, in an entanglement. A gill net, is can be up to a kilometer or more long. Um, sometimes the fishermen will set three of them and they're nowhere, they're not near their nets. So if there's an entanglement, there's nothing that fishermen can do. There's no evidence at all that uh, in either the light, this light trawl that uh, was the other type of new gear or the suripara, because the vessel is moving, that the vaquita get entangled in it. It's the gill nets which are set in the water and are um, uh, able to entangle a vaquita that's moving through. But also, as I mentioned, the, the gill nets that are the most dangerous are the ones with mesh sizes that are big to catch the gills of a shark or a fish. And that shark or fish, what's a totoaba, is about the same size as a uh, vaquita. So the vaquita can easily get their heads tangled in it. So it's the gill nuts, the way they're fished, it's the size of the mesh, and it's that their um, fishermen are not right there to do something. Okay, so this is uh, one of the videos that we produced um, with Chef Rob Ruiz there. And it was at a time where interest um, in using these new gears was really lagging. And we wanted to send a message to um, the fishermen in the upper Gulf that they weren't alone, uh, that we had their backs and we would buy these products if um, they would catch them. Yeah, that top one. Yeah. trying to find and have found fishermen who are willing to make the sacrifice to follow the right rules and protocol developing traps and nets that don't cause bycatch that don't harm the vaquita and that are bringing clean, responsible, traceable food to our tables here in San Diego. We want to make sure that these fishermen know that we support them 100% and asking them, please don't give up and please stand up and do the right thing 
and get these shrimp and get these fish the right way because it's the right thing for our planet, it's the right thing for our families, and it's the right thing for our foods and our bodies. This style of finding food the right way has become a national trend here in the States, and there's a whole nation of consumers that want to support them. Aquí en San Diego, lo mismo como Baja, es no tenemos México, no tenemos Baja, no tenemos California, pero tenemos la calafía. Es un mundo, es un parte del mundo muy especial. Nosotros. So we'll we'll have to share that link with folks um, for folks who weren't able to see it online. Um, okay. We're at four twenty. Yeah. Okay. So um, for, if you have any more questions, <laughs> if you have any more questions, please come down, uh, or um, we'll provide also Sarah's uh, email in the uh, chat so you can uh, send uh, questions to her. Uh, thank you again. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, uh, Dr. Sarah Mesnick for coming and giving this wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you all.